Good, good afternoon. I'm Steve Thompson. I'm going to talk about X forms. I've got quite a lot to say, so I'll get on straight with it. So, um, standards. Why do we want standards? Well, one of the main reasons is because you don't get locked in to software. Uh, if you don't like the browser or the FIFA viewer or whatever, well, you just download it from it and use it. And you could just load in the same formats into different software. On the other hand, if you use a proprietary format, then, you know, if you don't like software, well, you're screwed because uh, either you've got to live with it or uh, you've got to convert all your documents to, uh, to work in a new system. So that's one, one of the reasons, just one of the many reasons why standards are really useful. Now, I'm going to talk about the web in a bit, uh, or a bit, and, and I would have said that the key term for describing the original web was decorative. It's, it, it's, uh, it's a definition where you describe what you want rather than how to get it. And decorative definitions are very short and typically very easy to understand. Now, if we look at uh, 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 the, the poster child of HTML decorative markup, it's the hyperlink, where you've got uh, some information, um, but you don't have to do any work to get that displayed on the screen and to get all the, all the thing, things that can happen to it. It encapsulates, a, encapsulates, encapsulates a lot of behavior. Uh, and if you wanted to program that, it would be a lot of work to program, it, to program it. Now, unfortunately, now we have HTML5 where they decided to, that all design decisions would be done by the person making the, the web page by programming. The designers of HTML5 themselves were mostly programmers, and uh, and so uh, they didn't add very much to HTML5. There's not much design in there because they said if you need it, you can just program it out, which was fine for programmers, but for a vast number of people who would normally be uh, writing web pages, it was completely out of uh, out of reach. So a lot of very obvious things that really ought to be in HTML5 are not there simply because they say uh, program it out. And so along came frameworks um, uh, that, since most web authors are not programmers, uh, a lot of frameworks came along to help you create your web pages. But lots of them, and they're all different. Wikipedia lists 30, but uh, I'm sure there are loads more. And they're not standardized, they're all different. Which means that if your framework dies, I mean, if it doesn't get supported anymore, or if it doesn't work on one of the browsers that you want to support, well, you're screwed again. Uh, because what are you going to do? Recode all your documents uh, and have it in, in, in the near future, five or ten years. Uh, ten years ago, uh, the web pages from ten years ago still work now, but the question is, will they, ones that are made today, still be working again in, in ten years' long time? So basically, standardization has gone out of the window because they've turned HTML into a programming environment rather than a decorative uh, uh, environment. Um, uh, and, and then with the support of these frameworks, uh, everything, uh, you get locked into a particular framework. So I'm going to talk about XForms, uh, which is the one standardized framework. It's, uh, it's a language uh, defined at W3C, and it's actually in worldwide use. Uh, kind of me, I, uh, so, so people whisper to me, oh, it's, I installed the XForms here, so they're using it now. So uh, I only know these the, the, these people use it because somebody told me they installed it there or that a particular application runs it. But anyway, Carnaby runs on XForms. Uh, lots of Dutch uh, on device. Oh, and um, the Cadastre the the uh, runs on uh, XForms as well. A lot of UK government websites, the BBC, the US, and so on and so on. You can read it here, I don't have to read it out. So anyway, it's, it's used worldwide by, by lots of people. And actually, there are lots of implementations, which means if you don't like a particular implementation, then you just go and use a different one. Uh, and they're also spread around the world, in the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, France, UK, USA. And it's also part of uh, Open Office and Open Office, by the way. So a number of those are open source uh, too, and some of them are, are uh, company produced that you actually uh, have to license. So, we're at NLUG, NLUG, and uh, if there's one thing I know about this conference, people like to see code. So rather than just tell you about uh, some uh, abstract parts of, uh, of uh, XForms and how it works, I'm going to actually build an application, or at least show you one that I built, uh, in it before your eyes. It's a coherent application, it really does something. Uh, it uses most parts of XForms, so then you'll learn a bit about XForms on the way. It's amazingly fun because 
uh, I'm going to build a Google Maps sort of application in, in Xform. But first, before I do that, let me just tell you about some of the pr principles. So the essence of Xforms is that there's a strict separation between the data and, and the controls uh, in the program. Uh, the data is live. That is to say, as it changes, uh, so it appears uh, in the display, and you don't have to do anything about that. It just, uh, it just works. And the data is linked together so that if one changes, another can be updated to match. The controls are abstract. I'll show you this in a minute. That is to say, the controls don't describe how they should look on the screen. They describe what they do. And then you can use style sheets to style them just however you want. Everything is data, as you also see. And there's the, the basic uh, processing model is that you have the state of your data, which is being kept up to date automatically uh, amongst itself. Uh, and then if you get some state change, for instance, by interaction from the user, then you can listen for those changes and you can respond to them. So just to show you the, uh, the, the intent-based controls, these, are, these three things here are identical controls, just display them. <coughs> so if I go and, uh, and I select the color cyan, you see the other three controls immediately change to match. That's because they're linked to the same data. The data is live, so there's nothing, uh, there's, uh, there's nothing I have to do uh, to, to get this to work. It just works because that's how it's defined. So these are absolutely identical codes, coding underneath here, just being styled in a different way with style sheets. And uh, the other thing that uh, I'm going to show you before we move on to the actual, uh, uh, the actual uh, example is uh, li the live data. Everything is live. Uh, everything is data. So if I change this to, uh, to English, then you see that, uh, that uh, everything changes to match. And even if I select uh, uh, one of these values here, uh, then if I go here and change that to Dutch, then uh, that changes to man and French changes to masculine. So, uh, uh, so all the data is live, everything gets updated automatically for you. You just have to say this is bound to that those, those data values and it all happens automatically for you. And that is where we're going now. So, uh, so here's a very simple bit of export. So what I've got here is my data that, as I said, was separated from my controls everywhere. And all I've got is one piece of data, which is a URL. And this is pointing to a single tile uh, at OpenStreetMap. Open if I output it, so here's a control in the control in the display part of my uh, exports. If I just output it, then I just get to see this value. However, if I add media type as image slash star, then what happens is this URL gets interpreted as an, an image and it gets displayed for me. Simple enough. Now, uh, a URL open, uh, open street map is, has got a structure to it. It's got uh, the site where it's coming from, it's got a level of zoom, and it's got an X and Y coordinate for a huge, big world map. So we can split that up into the separate parts of the data. The site, the zoom level, the X and the Y. And we don't specify the URL anymore, we calculate it by saying it's the concatenation of the site, the zoom, blah, 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 blah. So, in other words, once I've entered this in, this gets calculated for me automatically. But the nice thing is that now that we've got data, we can actually start interacting with this data. So, I will show you. So here, it's the same, here's the URL, I'm, I'm displaying it, I'm outputting it. Here I'm outputting it as, a, as, a, as an image, and here are three of the values involved. So if I change just one of those, for instance, 511 to 512, then it just goes left. And if I change this into 41, then it goes south. So the data is live. I haven't had to do very much work to get this to, get this to do something fairly useful, simple but useful. Now, it's hard uh, entering the, uh, the numbers in this way, so I'm just going to add for every number that we're uh, entering uh, two triggers to increase or decrease the values, which you can see here. So here are the triggers. These just are going to increase and decrease the values so that now I can, uh, I can say uh, go, uh, go left, go up. And all I'm doing is just incrementing a number and the systems just say, oh, values have changed, blah, 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 and then it just happens. So I haven't had to do any work at all, really, uh, to get this to, to work properly. 
Now, uh, oh yeah, I suppose I should show you that the problem is, with, a problem with the, with the URL is that at each level of zoom, uh, the world coordinates double. And so it changes. So you can't use the same x and y uh, for a different level of zoom. You have to do a bit of calculation. So what we do is we keep the x and y coordinates for a position in the world, which I'm going to call pos x and pos y, and we calculate the tile x and y from that just by dividing it by the scale. And the scale is 2 to the power of 26 minus the zoom level, but just believe me, uh, there are 80 levels of zoom and 8 bits, uh, eight bits for the 256 pixels of the, of the tile, uh, but that's, that's the scaling. If you, do, if you desire, divide the, uh, the, the, posit the, the position in the world by that, that number, then you get the tile number. So we just do that with a bit of uh, with X forms that calculates those values. So that now, all of a sudden, as I zoom in, uh, I now really do uh, zoom in on the place that I've got. Now there's a problem here, and we might be able to see it if you look at the word London there. You see the word London sort of boils around the, the, uh, uh, on, the, on the tile. Now there's a reason for that. Because if you're looking at a particular zoom level and the point is in the middle, when you zoom out, as well, sorry, zoom in, then you get one of the four quadrants. And so that means, by definition, the point you're looking at is no longer in the middle. But as a user, of course, you want to have that point in the middle because that's what you're really looking at. So that's what we're now going to fix. How do we do that? I'm going to make a three by three uh, uh, array of tiles. Here is our point, and what we're going to do is put a porthole of 2x2 two two actually, that's visible over the top of our nine tiles, and then make sure that this point is always in the middle of the porthole, so that we're going to move the things behind over so that that point's always in the middle. So all we have to do is calculate two negative uh, offsets. Again, I'm not going to tell you the mathematics, but it's fairly simple to work out. We're going to work out the, uh, the, the offset of y and x uh, offsets, and then we're going to make sure that the, 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 the set of tiles is moved underneath the, uh, the porthole. So now, this is exactly what's happening. If I zoom in, you'll see the word London will now stay in the middle. Now, of course, you, you, you can understand this theoretically, but I'm going to really show you what it looks like here by not actually hiding the other bits. So this is a porthole. Here you can see the lines between the, the, between the tiles. And you can see that as I uh, zoom in, that you'll see the underlying uh, porthole, uh, or, or the porthole staying still, but the underlying tiles are being moved around uh, to, to fit. So the, the pit point that we're interested in is always in there. Let me just uh, again, uh, emphasize, I haven't done very much work here. I've just said what the relationships are between the data, but I'm not doing any work. I just said, these are the relationships. If it changes, please fix it. Oh, now I've got to go back to my other slides. So, of course, we don't want to click left and right and up and down. We want to use the mouse. And so, we're going to add a bit of data for the mouse. X and Y uh, coordinates for the mouse and its state of the, of the uh, mouse button up or down. So uh, we, we catch mouse events whenever it moves, we just set those values uh, to the current value uh, from the event. And if the mouse goes down, we uh, set the uh, state to down, and if the mouse goes up, we set it up. So now we've got live data for the mouse. So the moment I move the mouse over this area here, we're just watching that live data. Again, all I've said is catch these things, store it in my live data, and now I'm just outputting it here. And if I click down, up, down, up, down, you can. so it's just all live data. Did I? Yeah. Good. Uh, another thing that we want to do is change how the mouse looks every time that I click on it. So uh, what I'm doing is I'm going to calculate the cursor. And whenever the state is up, it's going to be uh, a pointer. And whether, whenever it's down, it's going to be move. That's, those are the values from CSS. And so I just style the cursor on, on the div. Uh, and you can see that here again. That, uh, well, I hope you can see it. 
that the mouse is now changing shape as I click. Again, I hadn't done, had to do very much, I just had to say, there's a value, and then uh, the system automatically keeps that up to date. Uh, we find the one in the middle there. The next page doesn't work. So, we're going to now use this live mouse data for moving the map. Uh, so what we're going to do is going to save the start and end points of a move um, so that we can calculate how far has been dragged and therefore how far the map data has got to be moved over. And we actually just subtract one from the other to give us the move distance because that's just easier. So we capture the start state just by catching the, the mouse down, which we were already catching anyway to set that value to down, so now we're just uh, capturing the mouse start and end value when the mouse goes down. Uh, every time the mouse moves, um, we, uh, we just update uh, the x and y uh, um, of, the, of the end position, so the mouse is moving with the mouse down, so we're just capturing the, the start and end, uh, sorry, the end position, and, uh, uh, and as I said, we just uh, um, calculate the distance moved by the difference between uh, the start and the end. So, we can see this happening. If I put the mouse down, we've got the start and end, and every time I move it while with, with the mouse still down, I'm getting a new end state, but the new end position, but not a new start position, and you can see the move is being uh, calculated um, uh, real time. Again, I'm not having to do any real work for that, I've just said what the relationships are, and everything just happens automatically. Uh, so, we're nearly there. The last thing we have to do um, is uh, to, to make sure the map moves with it. So, uh, what we have to do is uh, we, we add the last visit x and y position of where we are on the map. And we have a calculation to keep the pos x and pos y, that is, the point in the world that we're interested in, updated. So that's always got to be in the middle. So as we're dragging it around, we're keeping the pos x and pos y of the middle updated. So we just do that with a calculate as pos x and pos y, uh, sorry, as, as these things move, so, uh, uh, so these values get, uh, get, get updated. And the only thing we have to do then is to make sure that we update last x and last y when the mouse goes up, because that's where we've stopped the dragging. So now we can really see it happening. I go to my map, I click down, I start dragging. And all that's happening is data is being updated here. Uh, that that, that uh, one value, basically, the pos x and pos y is being updated. And the system is just, oh well, okay, I've got to update some more values to match that. And, uh, and, uh, and, and creating uh, and, and, and moving, uh, moving the, the, the tiles around, and if necessary, adding new tiles. Yes, question. So you calculate the distance from the start point to the end point? Yeah. But on this, at the same moment, the map is updated live, even... That's right, because, because the data values are being updated every time there's a mass move effect. The data is being updated, and so everything may, moves with it. So why do you calculate the... Distance. Um, that's because of the last x and last y. That when I take the mouse up, then then the, that's that state has to be preserved. Okay. The slides are all online, so uh, so you can have have a have a better look. I, I know I'm going through it quite fast here, um, but what I'm trying to just show is that how how easy things like this are are, are to do. So um, we've got a fantastic framework. Now. I mean, I'm, th this is the basis, but, but from now on, all the rest is just bells and whistles. So if I want to use a different set of tiles, well, all I have to do is change the value of sight, and I can select a number of different ones, and by changing that value of sight, so here's the standard map, and if I go to a cycle map, all I've done is change the value of the sight variable, and everything gets updated. So this is a, this is a, a different source, this is a cycling map, uh, here's a transport, which is uh, trains and buses, um, and uh, somewhere far in the world, somebody's done an impressionistic map of the world. Um, and, uh, and as long as they use the, uh, the, 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 the same format for the, uh, for the URL, uh, it, just, uh, it just works. Unfortunately, the people who supplied the satellite uh, 
pictures uh, recently stopped doing it for the public, so I can't demonstrate that. But, well, I can demonstrate it, but then you can see that the message uh, from uh, MapQuest says, sorry, we've discontinued this service. So, what you've just seen is 150 lines of, uh, of, uh, of X forms, it depends exactly what you count, not a single while loop. And uh, the reason for this is that it's actually a different way of programming. It's actually declarative programming, where you say what you want and not how to get there, and you let the system do the work for you. So uh, a map like the one I've just done, you can see it as a presentation of two values, x and y coordinates. All you're doing is calculating those x and y's, and then everything's being done for you. What, what we do is abstract the data out of an application, and that becomes the essence of the application, because the data is live. And then we just have invariants to a display that just gets up, updated all the time. Now, because I've gone through this so fast, I can now tell you some, some, some interesting stories about X-Forms, because um, uh, 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 I mentioned some of the companies that, uh, that used it, but uh, I, I occasionally get uh, nice stories from people uh, about how well it's worked. And so I'm going to tell you three examples of uh, people using uh, X-Forms in the wild for major projects. The first one is a company whose name I'm not allowed to tell you because they don't want their competitors to know that they've saved, saved so much money. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what they do is they build very, very big machines, uh, machines that you walk into. Now, I'll, I'll give you an example of what it might be, though it's not. Imagine you're building a ship, right? Now, you get a customer, and the customer comes along and says, I want a ship, please. And you say, yes, sir. What would you like on your ship? And then uh, the customer says, well, I'd like three swimming pools, a thousand bedrooms, uh, three kitchens, two dining rooms. You know, just all the things that they want in the ship. But then, of course, when you want all those things, that means that you've got to have lots of other things as well, um, uh, like power supplies. Uh, if you're going to be saving the Atlantic, you probably want a couple of power supplies and a couple of backups as well, just in case they go wrong, because you don't want to be stuck in the middle of the Atlantic with no electricity. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, German uh, shipbuilders use X-Forms for configuring ships like, like that because, because there are simple relationships between, oh well, if you want another kitchen, then you're going to have two more power supplies and an air conditioning unit, for, for instance. But anyway, building this ship, each time you get an order, so each ship is different. Each ship has got a, a different collection of, of things that need to be controlled. And so the control room is very, very complex. And in fact, the control room each time is different. And the nice thing is that they used to program this in the classical way. Um, and one year they decided to try x -forms. Now, they knew that it took them five years with 30 people to do it normally, to, to program the user interface, as it were, for, for a whole machine. And with x -forms, they managed to do it in one year with 10 people. So they reduced their costs by more than an order of magnitude. Uh, and I reckon they saved 14 million units of currency. Um, and, uh, and four years, of course, um, uh, in, uh, in, in, in producing this. OK, that was an example. Example two um, is a British insurance company. Uh, and the manager had heard about this possibility of decorative programming. And, uh, and he thought, well, we ought to try it out. And so he, he knew that somebody in his staff knew how to do decorative programming. And so he, he called in his regular programming manager and he called in this decorative person and said, right, here's the application we want to build. I'll give you two days to go away and plan it out and tell me how long you think, how, uh, how long you think you have a need in order to program it, okay? You've got two days to, to, to plan it out. So two days later they came back and the programming person said, I need another 30 days to give you the answer. And the XFORMS person said, I've already programmed it. <laughs> the third example, which is the newest one, and I can tell you the name of the company here in this case, is the National Health Service in Britain. Um, they wanted to build a national uh, uh, patient record service. So it's going to be distributed over machines um, 
uh, and so we're talking about 60 million people, so we're talking about lots of, uh, lots of data. So they stuck 10 million pounds into this and 70 people. Um, they produced the system, which was hardware. The hardware was extremely expensive. Uh, the hardware itself was five pounds per patient. So multiply that by 60 million, and you can see that, that this is an expensive project. But basically, the project failed. It didn't work, and so it collapsed. And so uh, one uh, one single guy said, "I can do this." He took it. Took it. Uh, he did it in excellence. Uh, it's running on Raspberry Pis. <laughs> it costs a penny per patient. It's now running in five London hospitals, and it's slowly being expanded out to, uh, from there. So my message is uh, that uh, that there's a lot to be saved by using uh, using X forms because you don't have to worry about all that irritating. Uh, uh, stuff in programming about uh, making sure that everything's up to date because the system does it for you. Um, uh, and the nice thing is that it's a W3C standard, so it's supported by lots of different people uh, and uh, companies uh, can, can provide uh, can provide implementation. So uh, I think that's about 30 minutes, so I'm a little bit under the time, but there's plenty of room for questions, I think. So. Yeah? I'm also interested if you know of any uh, failed examples of where it does not apply. Um, well, I, uh, somebody has pr proven that x is Turing complete. So... <laughs> 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 which, which in the beginning was a worry, I have to say. Uh, but he wrote a Pascal interpreter in x which I thought was a very interesting, <laughs> interesting thing to do, interesting challenge. Um, I, honestly, I honestly haven't ever heard somebody say, we tried it and it didn't work. But that doesn't mean to say that that, doesn't, that hasn't happened. It is a different way of thinking. And that, I'm, and that you do have to learn a new way of programming. I made it look very simple because I've gone through all those processes now. But on the other hand, I know of people who've, who've just just been totally blown away with how, how simple it is. And that you know, they've been working for years in the traditional way, and then suddenly they, they see this method and, and, and they realize that they can get things done much quicker. So, I can't give you an example. Nobody's come to me and said, oh, this didn't work. But um, uh, I've, 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 I, I suppose I'm more likely to hear the success stories. Can you, can you then perhaps elaborate on how it's implemented? Is it, because it's, it's browser-based, right? So well, no, it's not necessarily browser-based. Because, For instance, it's in uh, um, uh, open office, uh, so, uh, so that's, not, that's not a browser. Uh, it's, it's quite an interesting story in itself because we deliberately designed it to be implementable in lots of different ways. So there are, there are three basic ways that it's done. Firstly, native, actually just running on your machine. Um, secondly, uh, um, where you, you basically download uh, a bit of JavaScript uh, uh, which do, does it all for you. Uh, so it's still running on the client, but you haven't got a, a, a then it is running in a browser, but you haven't got a particular uh, implementation on your machine. And the third way um, is uh, where everything is done on the server, um, that it's converted down to uh, whatever your, your machine will accept. And I, I know a number of companies like this because uh, it's translated on the, on the machine, so you specify it once and it's translated on the machine down to your phone or your laptop and you, you get different presentations depending on, on, on the different style of, de of device. Uh, so that gives, you, that, that gives you a bit more freedom on the, on the, on the server side to be able to deli deliver to different, uh, deli different d devices. How is uh, persistency? Available. Um, so persistence is just done using a regular HTTP submit. Okay. So it, it's I, I, and that's one of the reasons why some people just love it so much because you know you've got all this data and then you say submit and that's it. 
James Bond. Could you show the slide with uh, the implementations? Yeah, sure, sure. I'm sorry, I'm, walk I'm walking a bit funny because I've got this thing. <laughs> um, uh, let me see, that was in my introduction. Uh, here. So, um, uh, XSLT forms is the only pure client side uh, version uh, one. Um, Betterform and Orbion are both server side implementations. Um, uh, OpenOffice and LibreOffice are the only native ones that I know of. And I honestly don't know uh, uh, about CM Pro. Uh, in, well, I know a bit more about inventive designers. I guess that's uh, server side as well. And I know nothing about Java. But I think that those three are all server side, uh, server -side uh, implementations. Inventive Design has got a great one. It runs on, for instance, iPhone, and, and if you change the, uh, the, the, the how the, the phone is, then it gives you a different display. It catches that event, and it's really nice. They do done some, done some great stuff. Yeah. What's your suggestion for the first steps to start with it? Um, well, so if you go to my homepage, okay. the very first thing you come to is the answer. Is the answer to that question? Your homepage is. Coming, uh, okay. just, just Google my name. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll find the slides, to, the, today's slides there as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the MapQuest example reveals that the source code for this has been existing for some while. Are there any new developments on this? On, on this example, you mean, or on export? Well, so, so export it is, uh, it started as the name suggests. Uh, XForm started off as forms for the web, and uh, we were, it was going to be in XHTML, and so we were very carefully following what was in HTML already because uh, of people's expectations, basically. Um, and so that was XForm 1.0, which basically could only do forms. generalized it just a little bit we could do much more and that's when we realized we could do actually do applications with it and so uh, there was um, there was a guy uh, in Denmark who transformed all his JavaScript applications for a phone company into X forms and the amount of code was about a quarter uh, of the length now uh, uh, what is known from research is that the number of bugs in a program is uh, not linear with the size, but it's uh, it's the length of the program to the power of one and a half, approximately, which would mean that you would expect ten times as many bugs in something that's four times longer. So, so that's another reason why it's so quick to or quicker to you do uh, exports because it's just physically shorter. Um, so that that that's how we got uh, exports 1.1. Uh, and then just from that we're generalizing more and version 2 which is in preparation now uh, um, just just does more more great stuff will it be compatible version 1 and uh, it, that's the intention yes uh, there might be slight corner old weird little corners that don't do the same thing but in all cases it's meant to do the same in fact most most of the active implementations are sort of slowly adding the, uh, the XForms uh, 2 stuff in. So I, I actually use some XForms 2 stuff here to, uh, in, this, uh, in this example. Uh, well, yeah? Uh, my uh, off topic is uh, what are you using for the presentation? Because you can use XForms uh, online, I think. So. Uh, yeah, so, so I was, I'm using HTML 
uh, with uh, X forms uh, in uh, iframes. Okay. And that, that was more just to allow me to be able to edit the, uh, the, uh, the examples separately from the, from the talk. So otherwise I would just put them straight in the talk by thought. I'll keep them separate. Any questions? Mm -hmm. No more questions? Well, time to have a drink then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah.